uh, 15. Chapter 15, we had, remember the lost sheep? The lost coin and the lost son. Three parables and they were all about something that was lost and then found. Now, I'm in Luke 16. And Luke 16, I'm going to tell you, even the commentators, the, the, the great scholars, they're confused too. <laughs> in chapter 16, it begins with the parable of the unrighteous steward. Now, it's kind of a, a simple story, sort of. Um, it's about how to handle things in this world, material things and immaterial things. Things of the world, such as money, uh, all the good stuff, stuff that comes to you and passes through your life. That's material. But then you get divine ideas. You get guidance and inspiration. You have all your divine faculties. That's the immaterial stuff also that we are stewards of. So you've got a guy who's uh, going to be a steward here, and he's, he's an interesting kind of steward. He's, uh, well, let's just read some of it. Jesus, we're talking about here, he also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a steward. Can you think of who this rich man might be? Who owns everything? Yeah. It makes sense that that's kind of the ultimate rich man, right? It all comes from God. It all is God. It all belongs to God. But God wants you to have some of it. And... He had a steward. That's, a, that's kind of a manager over his estate. Isn't that what we are here on this planet? This is all here for us to use and to express a God consciousness in this world to each other, to all the creatures, to build our lives on a good, solid God or spiritual foundation. So, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his good. What kind of steward are, is that? And if we are stewards, are we wasting God's goods? Have you ever had a moment in your life where you kind of looked at the mail that came in and uh, looked at the bills and had the same thought that I had at one time a few years ago? All of a sudden, I, I even said it out loud to myself. I'm hemorrhaging money. Talk about an issue of blood. I need to see Jesus real fast, right? Man. Have you had times where you've had all this great guidance, but you didn't follow it? Or you had a divine idea, but you let it go. Somebody else got it, ran with it. I can't tell you how many things I've seen on late night television. I said, I invented that. Sound like my father. And when, he was, when he was here, somebody one day talked about one of the pieces of music that, that I played and how wonderful it was. He said, oh, I wrote that. Since he was my father, they believed him. My father would tease anybody. <laughs> because he didn't write it. Anyway, there's a lot of opportunities we've let go. Times where we've had an opportunity appear, 
I'm not good enough for that. Uh, I can't do that. I'll make a mess of it, so I won't try. That's not a good steward, is it? So we sometimes fit in that same category, wasting the goods. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? He's heard that he is not dealing with the owners, the rich man's goods well. Turn in the account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. He's being removed from the position. Now, the guy's pretty clever, I have to say this. The steward is clever. Listen to him. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, to be a ditch digger. And I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that people may receive me into their houses when I'm put out of the stewardship so that he still looks good. He's going to become a chef. What do you think he's going to cook? The books. He's going to cook the books. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. So the steward said to the, the debtor, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. He's cutting it in half. But here's what we're not told but what we need to know. It was not uncommon for a steward like this who was unrighteous to loan out the rich person's goods and then get it back with interest. 50% Actually, it would be 100%, wouldn't it? If I give you 50, 50 uh, measures of oil and I went back 100, I'm charging you 100% interest. So, that's what he was doing. He was taking the the full amount. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. This guy only charged 20. But that was all, like the, the 50 of the first one, all to go into his pocket. So now he's, he's getting the goods back and he's going to start looking like a righteous man. The master commended the dishonest steward. Notice, we're still calling him a dishonest steward. But he's commending him for his shrewdness. And says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Dealing with their own generation, the sons of this world. Who are the sons of this world? Well, we're children of God, right? But when we're in strictly human consciousness, human thinking, i got to get my good at another's expense, i got to charge as much interest to get as much money as I can out of this, we're the sons of this world, of human consciousness and human ego. And more shrewd in dealing with their own generation. See how he was treating other human beings who were not his boss, who were not above him, the actual rich man who owned everything, treating him differently 
than the sons of light. Who are the sons of light? That's a, that's a phrase that comes from the Essenes. Sons of light. Believers, yes. Those who realize that spark of divinity within. So they, have, they, they acknowledge and are recognize the light within themselves. Isn't that some of us? Isn't that all of us? I hope. If it isn't, lie to me and just say, yeah, it's all of us. Sure it is. So it goes on. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon. That's material goods. Stuff. Stuff. He says unrighteous. Mammon is neither good or evil. It's what we do with it. It's how we think of it. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Making a god of it. Making it, putting it on a special place and making it the reason for your existence. Unrighteous mammon, it just, it's, it's material goods just are. So that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal habitations in, in their houses. Remember, he's, he was planning on making this, this deal with all the debtors to get the goods back. So he, he looked good, but at the same time, he would not lose face in his community. And after he lost his job, they would have him in his house. He would have friends. He would have people who might help him. How very nice. And the next one, he who is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. You've heard that before, right? And I, I have grown in, in my lifetime to see that, that I believe this is very true. If we deal well with a small thing, if we treat a small thing as deserving our care and attention, we'll also do that with the larger, more important things. As an example, you've all stood in line at a cashier and, and gotten change back and had an opportunity to get more money than you should have gotten. Well, that's sort of a small thing. They're not giving you $100 or $1,000 extra. They may be giving you a quarter too much or $2 too much. What do you do? What's the right thing to do? Give it back. Because even if it's a penny, what are you doing if you recognize that they've given you too much and you know, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, see if they really... Isn't that theft? Getting your good at another's expense. In some cases, you know, cashiers have to make that up. Not in all cases, but in some businesses they do. Um, we, uh, the church, has an account, and not an account, but a, a, a membership to uh, Costco, and as, as a church, we are tax exempt. So when I, Sue or I go there and buy things for the church, like your cups and plates, plasticware, I tell them ahead of time it's tax exempt. But I also have the ability to use the card to pick up things that I need. What is the right thing for me to do? This is taxable. And I make a point of doing that. Because it's the right thing. I'm not tax exempt. And if it's for me, it does not qualify to be tax exempt. If, if we can't handle a little bit, 
How can the universe keep giving us more and greater good? What eventually the, Luke calls the true riches. The true riches aren't those, all the, the divine ideas of God and also the, the principles and powers of God that work through us. We need to be honorable in all of them. We need to be good stewards. Use it for the highest and the best. And he who is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. I think that proves true. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true riches? If you haven't dealt with the material stuff and handled that righteously, how can you be entrusted with the immaterial all the divine ideas of God, divine energy, a divine substance. How can you have more spiritual power in your life if you can't handle the other stuff, the smaller things? The next verse. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Yeah. It's amazing. I can get so upset, well, uh, uncomfortable, if... And, and this may sound strange, but... If I'd find a $100 bill in this place, on the floor, or under a table, I would want to know and find out which one of you lost it. And of course, every one of you would tell me, I did. <laughs> if I found your engagement ring, that, you know, five carat diamond that is so beautiful under the seat, man, I'd be, have all this drive to find out who it belonged to and get it to you. Because I feel it's, that's my job. Not, not as a minister, it's my job as a human being. As a brother to whomever lost it. Who will give you that which is your own? Who can give you that which is your own? Who does? The Father, providing us with infinite substance. And it seeks to express that substance fully and freely to us and through us. It's important for us to use it for good. To use it for good. Oh my. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I know how to use it for good. And I have to ask, show me. You know, do I? Do I buy mm, this new car? Or, Lord, do I have to pay off these credit cards? <laughs> or, or my student loans? Don't have any, but there was a time where I had one. <laughs> Thank goodness those, that's gone. Um, What's responsible? Taking care of what you owe first before acquiring more, I think. So, 
in many ways, this is an interesting, interesting passage. Uh, the, the various commentators, it's fascinating to, to read several of them and find out. One says the parable ends, verse 8, the beginning, first half of verse 8. Somebody says it goes further, and another one says it goes all the way to 13. Even they don't agree on, this is a strange parable. It has not only this, this parable, but it follows the next part. I'm just going to read the next part to you. I didn't put it on the, in the script. And the, the section in my Bible, you know, I have the best Bible in the world here, uh, Jesus answers the Pharisees. That's the title over this section. The Pharisees who were lovers of money. See how it's going to start to fit in with the parable. Heard all this and they scoffed at him. But he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Yeah. God doesn't care about the stuff. The stuff doesn't mean anything to God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone enters it violently. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than from one dot of the law to become void. Well, you've heard of various spiritual laws, right? The law of mind action. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Oh, well, but I can get away with this one. I, I, it's okay if I have just this one, one negative thought. No, it's not. It, no, it's not. Not one little bit of law will ever be set aside. Now, we, any of you ever kind of push the speed limit a little bit? When we come to a stop sign, how, how big a stop are we supposed to have? Do we actually have to stop moving? Do we? Anybody know? Or can you kind of slow down and then go on through the thing? Oh, no. You're supposed to come to a full stop. Yeah, <laughs> here's the expert. I've done that, I've gotten a ticket. Yes, yes, ma'am. Full stop. But we push the law, don't we? We do it in a lot of little ways. Oh, maybe I can get away with this. Uh, well, I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> There's one I've been doing probably for the last three weeks occasionally. When you go across 9th Street West and you get to Maine, on the other side of Maine, half the, the west part is blocked off. There's only the lane going east for that last inner city block. So I get there and I think, mm, nothing's coming. <laughs> I shoot right up the, the eastbound lane. And then when I get past the barricade, I get over into the other lane. We push the law now and then, and we do that with spiritual law. Well, you know, I can do one kind of unrighteous thing and get away with it. Well, the law is the law. And one thing about the law and spiritual law is it's eternal. It never changes. You can count on it. That means when you know about it and you know how to do it and you know how to live by it, oh, that's all you got to do because it works perfectly every time and all the time. Easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. It's an interesting parable. It's about being a good steward. Not just of material stuff but of the other stuff of God, the immaterial stuff, our faculties, our minds, 
our prayer, our spiritual energy. Being that son of light, child of light that we are. Instead of a child or son of darkness, 